Right, you seeing that? That's great, that's great then. And as Michael would have said to us, always get a photo of yourself with plenty of, uh, a landscape photo with plenty of space on the side for a caption. <laughs> Do you, know, do you know the story about this picture at all? Because I say it's, um, not many people do a shot like that, but it's, it was very uh, opportune for us. No, I don't actually. I, if I had to guess, I'd say it was Battersea Park because that's where we used to go and go and hang out in those days. It wasn't far from his flat. Oh. We used to go play tennis there, and the, um, we went one time in January, and it was raining so hard that he couldn't hit the ball back over the net towards me, and I kept winning all the points. Oh. So we uh, we gave up and walked home in the rain. So aqua tennis was another talent of uh, Michael's. It turns out, yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, should we uh, say we uh, we get the show on the road? People have come up uh, and uh, thing there. Um, right. Well, next slide, please, Ben. Sure. Hello, so I can really uh, formally welcome you to the Michael Bland Memorial Lecture. Uh, my name is Andy Green. Um, I was a friend and, uh, of Michael's and a, uh, a colleague, worked on, uh, spoke at many conferences together, uh, delivered many training programs alongside each other. Uh, one of my favourite stories of Michael was... Um, he would always try different things with Michael in his presentations, and, um, and, and he was also keen on meditation. And he was, Michael was doing the uh, conference spot before me, before I came on. And it was interesting meditation. We got the entire audience to close their eyes for about three or four minutes. Um, and it was very weird for me coming on to then give my presentation. But he gave me a great intro that it was the only time I've ever done a talk where the audience had fallen asleep before I spoke. But um, we had many a, a good time, uh, uh, Michael. Incredible professional and learned immense. And I think one of the amazing qualities was his sharing and giving and supporting uh, and really which inspired uh, the idea of the learning resource pack and the idea of uh, Bland's Law, which we'll explain a bit shortly. So, so my name is Andy Green. Um, we're hosting today with uh, Michael's son, Ben Bland. Uh, Michael, um, uh, it's interesting, Ben, that you followed your father in the sort of a marketing communications world. So um, uh, very much in the digital sector in terms of um, uh, the marketing comm side. And I know reading your bio about you're very much closely involved in innovation and product development uh, and tech ethics. And uh, I know you, um, would, uh, as you're involved in uh, AI groups around the world uh, in terms of raising standards and raising awareness. And uh, you describe yourself as a multimedia storyteller. So really, I mean, I think we're seeing some great examples of this in the brilliant work you've done in producing the learning resource and also the deck we have here today. Uh, and we're also blessed here today with two very, very special guests. Um, uh, the learning resource pack that's been produced in honor of uh, Michael and using much of Michael's uh, wise words and experience also featured contributions uh, from 10 leading crisis comms experts, uh, two of which are with us today. Uh, Amanda, how are you? I didn't think you were going to speak to me, so I was I was on mute. No, no uh, problem. No. How, how are we today, Amanda? Good, thank you, and, and really honoured to, to be um, able to be here and be asked to be part of this, so thanks for that. That's great. So Amanda, Amanda's background, uh, you're the author of uh, Crisis Comm Strategies. Um, you also do a lot of uh, training delivery, I know, including for the PRCA there. Um, you run your own agency. And I noticed you told me you survived 20 years in police comm. So uh, that must have given you an incredible experience in which you're now uh, sharing uh, worldwide with your, you know, your consultancy clients there. And also in the room, uh, Porik McEwen, good friend of mine uh, from Dublin. Porik, hello. Hi, Dandy. How are you? And good evening, everybody. And it's a, it's a privilege to be here, a pleasure to be here. And thank you for the opportunity uh, of participating and uh, learning as well as hopefully leaving a little bit behind. OK, thank you very much. And again, Porik was one of the uh, 10 expert contributors, does a lot of crisis PR uh, work in, in Ireland and uh, as a university lecturer, uh, as well as um, I think as a pracademic is the word we use, Porik, to describe someone who spans both areas there. Uh, and uh, you're also um, president of the Public Relations Institute of Ireland. That's right. Uh, thank you. Welcome you for being here today. Uh, OK, so... Uh, our host, myself and Ben, our guest. Um, ben, can you move on, please? So really, uh, what we're covering today is um, 
a tribute to Michael for those of you who knew him and those who didn't. Um, um, you know, Michael's story, Michael's legacy, and Michael's inspiration. And also then to introduce you to these ideas of um, the, what we call Bland's Law and Bland's Law Once Removed. And what we're hoping to achieve from this is firstly to provide you with an area of uh, professional practice, but also maybe recreate these memes. So um, uh, anytime anyone's in a crisis situation, uh, we can invoke Bland's Law. And through that, really, uh, that meme then becomes a, a very powerful legacy uh, for Michael. And part of our learning resource kit that we've produced that we're launching today uh, features a range of crisis scenarios. So we'll be inviting you in the audience, uh, giving you a, two examples from the learning resource pack uh, with an A, B or C outcome. Uh, we're fingers crossed hoping the technology will work um, and inviting you to submit your poll then. Um, and then, as I say, a panel discussion and really uh, also open out to you, uh, the audience here in terms of uh, what you've heard, what your thoughts and um, how do we take Bland's Law going forward there. So a lot to cover in the next uh, 25 minutes and uh, hopefully we'll do Michael proud in the process. Uh, next slide, please, Ben. Uh, so really, Ben, um, your father was an amazing man. Um, can you tell us a bit more, you know, about um, his story, uh, your, 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 your memories, your thoughts uh, on, this, on, this, on this day today? Yeah, I'd be delighted. Thank you. Uh, it's really nice to see you all here. Um, this is an enormous honour, but it's also such a positive thing. And it's exactly what Dad would like, is um, us trying to create a positive message from, from his life, um, try to continue his work. Um, oh, someone's asking if they're going to take screenshots from presentation. I don't see why not. Um, Absolutely, record please. Recording it as well, um, basically to share with those people who said they couldn't couldn't make it. But we do have that recording as well, if that's um, handy. Um, I'm pretty much going to just read off the script here because it's easier for me, so I don't ramble too much if I'm talking about um, Dad's life because it's quite hard to uh, uh, cover his story um, succinctly. So I've done my best here. So be bear with me. Um, sure. And if you'll if you'll indulge me, I'll open with the, one of his favorite li uh, lines from Roger Kipling. Um, they copied all they could copy, but they couldn't copy my mind. And I left them sweating and stealing a year and a yeah. half behind. Yeah. <laughs> it was one of his favorites. So anyway, um, Michael Bland, Mike, my dad, who was born in 1944 and died exactly a year ago today, was a man of stories. He built a remarkable career on stories. He got himself into a lot of them and he told them better than most. Among a list of achievements and anecdotes too long to even tell if I had you all afternoon, Dad could claim to have played the lead at a national student a drama event, been a, an officer in the British Army where he specialised in winter survival and was top of his regiment in boxing and on this, the assault course. He was a competitive athlete for many years, even representing Great Britain in their over 40s group. He was the head of a spiritual healing clinic. He was a bilingual MC for a rodeo. Yep. Uh, this was the same rodeo that generated one of Dad's greatest stories, the night the bulls got out. Um, but there's no time to tell it here, but picture being held at gunpoint by a neo-Nazi security guard with a snarling attack dog after breaking into an 80 room brothel in an attempt to round up half a dozen bulls, at least one of which had actually killed people for sport. And on leaving the military in the 60s, um, Mike discovered the, a dream to be a writer. And while initially working as a stockbroker in Germany, he got into financial journalism, which led to a job in Reuters. By the mid 70s, he had become a regular writer for various financial journals. This went on to him taking the lead in corporate and government communications at the Institute of Directors and then at Ford Motor Company, where he described himself as, quote, the meat in the sandwich between Henry Ford and Margaret Thatcher. If you want to picture that image for a second. Uh, in the mid, mid 80s, uh, Dad set himself up as a freelance communications consultant working out of our family home in Essex and he remained a lone gun for the rest of his career. The list of his career achievements is humbling. His clients included Bank of England, GSK, Nokia, Intel, government officials around the world, and British royalty. He had face-to-face -face interactions with two prime ministers, a few ministers, several renowned journalists and business leaders, and the England football manager. He provided crisis management services on several headline news events, including delivering the crisis communications plan for the European National Banks on the launch of the Euro, which at the time was claimed as, quote, the biggest product launch in world history. Dad was a master communicator. 
He delivered a lot of high profile speaking engagements and taught presentation and media skills to more than 10,000 trainees. He authored 11 textbooks, two best selling humor titles, 10 short stories, and numerous articles for national and industry publications, as well as a handful of scripts for comedy television programs. And who was dead to me and to his loved ones? While he always seemed like a superhero in my eyes, with his exceptional intelligence, confidence, and athleticism, he was a gentle man, kind, humble, patient, gracious, and generous. Despite his love of entertaining people with stories, he spoke softly, liked his own company, and, and lived somewhat in his own head. At some point just after the millennium, Michael's arm started to shake and he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And while Parkinson's undeniably impacted his life, robbing him of much of his superhero status to, to make him appear in the eyes of a doting son anyway, as a mere mortal, he never let illness become his story. The same brave, gentle, astute and funny man remained present in a diminishing body right up to the end. And then in the autumn of 2020, he had a bad fall while carrying his shopping. Typical of dad, he didn't even tell us about it. He then fell again and reluctantly went to hospital. He had severely broken his, his hip. He spent Christmas on a shared ward as COVID was ripping through the hospital and his body was overwhelmed. For the family to say goodbye, we were only able to join by video call. To summarize my parting words to my beloved father, I said nothing. When I thought about what final message I wanted to impart on a man who had lived and told a thousand stories and who had raised us with nothing but gentle compassion, I realized that there was nothing that had been left unsaid. I told him I loved him, but I knew he already knew that. And here I will close with another of his favorite passages, this time from Omar Khayyam. These few words are written on the simple box for which we scattered his ashes over the river where we used to fish for crabs on our family holidays. I think this passage says a lot about the immortal power of words and story which ran so richly through my father's blood. The moving finger writes and having writ moves on, nor all thy piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all thy tears wash out a word of it. Thank you. Okay, we can get back into it. You're muted, Andy. Well, lots of words in more, more than one sense here. Uh, ben, thank you so much. Um, reflect here on a marvellous, marvellous man. Uh, shall we move on now, Ben, please? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so plans a lot. I mean, how did that come about with um, in terms of Michael and his life and his work? I mean, what, what captures it for you, Ben? Yeah, well, I think um, even at a very personal level, uh, Dad had a habit of seeing the positive in everything and would always try to bring the most out of everything he did. And so it wasn't just a professional attitude of finding the opportunity in every crisis it really was his his view on things and the way he communicated um you know his own own feelings and when um andy and i spoke shortly after his passing um we decided to try and generate something meaningful and useful out of that credo um so we developed this free teaching resource which you're all very welcome to copy share um even better um suggest contributions to it um our plan um, is to add contributions each year. Um, and uh, so what we've got at the moment, um, and we're now happy to introduce to, to the world, is a set of case studies um, that kind of talk about this idea of um, crisis, from, opportunity from crisis. Um, and yeah, we'll be going through that a little bit later in our, in our chat today. Thank you, Ben. Okay, so uh, what's, I mean, as, an, as a, um, a philosophical idea, but is there any sort of science in it? So Ben, next slide, please, mate. Um, and really, Bland's law exists because of complexity, and uh, our reality is innately chaotic and complex. Uh, in a crisis, um, there's a danger that one could be over-focused. So we're using a, a standard management tool here that identifies three levels of different types of problem. There are critical problems that have got a neat beginning, uh, middle and end, and are solvable. Uh, tame, more complex, but ultimately solvable. And wicked, that's chaotic, no precise beginning, middle or end, 
infinitely complex and systemic, uh, whether it's, you can think of examples like COVID, uh, world economic crisis, there I mentioned Brexit, but even every individual is a wicked problem walking on legs with their complexity. And the reality is in a, in a crisis situation, you're looking for, quotes, a solution. And therefore, the challenge we have is that um, uh, you're looking for a focused solution in a complex situation. And so therefore, it's inevitable that you may be in danger of over-focus too tightly framing what you're perceiving to be the, the, your situation, when in reality, it's far bigger than that, and so therefore may contain far more opportunities. So by invoking Bland's Law, where you recognise there's a bigger picture, there's a bigger dimension, that holds the root, the key to exploring opportunities in any crisis there. Next slide, please, Matthew. So we uh, contacted the uh, 10 leading uh, world's leading crisis comms, uh, uh, Jonathan Hemerson, UK, Amanda from uh, the UK, and Kate Hartley, uh, Tony Jacks from Australia, uh, Fred Garcia from the United States, uh, Sheena Thompson from Britain, uh, Kel, who's in the audience here, welcome here today to Kel, uh, from Norway, uh, Porrick from Ireland and uh, uh, Louise Douglas and Mark Bukowski from the UK, uh, covering both geography and also different areas of uh, involvement and interest. So uh, some of many of you may know that Mark involved in a hell of a lot of um, celebrity uh, uh, crisis situations. Uh, Louise is um, a crisis comms expert in cyber communications. And so again, a good variety of people who really when invited to comment on uh, Bland's Law, not only provided a comment, but also stretched, helped us uh, to identify various nuances, different angles, different dimensions to the concept. So as a result, we've come away with a far richer uh, concept of what consists of Bland's Law. Uh, next slide, please. Mark. So um, really, we've got two of the contributors in the room. Um, and, uh, Amanda, um, you're, I mean, thank you again for your brilliant response when approached uh, to contribute. Um, Bland's Law, there's, a cri there's an opportunity in any crisis. What was your sort of take on that? Before, before I say anything, I just have to say, Ben, that was an amazing um, uh, kind of run through. Um, really emotional as well. So I got, I got very emotional if I, uh, if I get a bit wobbly. Um, yeah, I think the thing for me with this is, I, I mean, one of the things I always talk about is looking from the outside in first the bubble of the organization that you're responding for or with um and that's very much part of this isn't it it's like seeing the bigger picture um and there is a huge i mean there's an opportunity to make things better there's an opportunity to improve the future there's an opportunity to respond effectively there's so much that you can positively take from what is probably going to be people's worst point um in that the you know that they're dealing with um and for me and i think anybody who knows me will hear me talk about this all the time it's the people bit that it really matters so you have got a huge opportunity as a communicator to make a really positive impact um but you have to take it into a different sphere and look from a different perspective uh so i think that's the that was the key for me um i think when you get to the uh bland's law do you call it once removed? I probably said it wrong. But anyway, that bit, yeah. I think, well, see, almost right. Um, I think then uh, that's that's uh, a nuance that you need to be really careful with. And I think, Andy, and you and I have had conversations around this. And you need to be think things through and also remember the kind of ethical approaches um, and the importance of, of taking that through. Um, but I think if this just gets people to think differently, um then you know that that's that's got to be a positive thing so uh, uh, again uh, one of the mistakes i think so many people make when the crisis pr um i almost like saying it's emotional stupid that you know they just look at the facts the logistics and not the emotions and uh, and that's both emotionals external and internal which i know you're very strong on there amanda in terms of uh, ensuring that the emotional dimension is fully covered there yeah, I mean, I think you're dead. You're absolutely right. You know, the the there's a huge amount of emotions caught up in any situation, um, and whilst you do have to be able to step away from that, and I was just having, I share, you know, I'm very honest now. I was shedding a couple of tears there. I've heard of Michael. I never actually got the opportunity to meet him, but you know, you 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 can then do that and go, okay, 
and back into doing what you need to do professionally. Um, but you have to be part of an emotional response um, and, and recognize the emotional response. Um, and I'll shut up now because I could just yeah. talk forever. Well, thank you, Amanda. Uh, Porik, um, as I say, in terms of uh, you're invited to contribute about what is Bland's Law and, uh, in any crisis an opportunity, uh, what was your take, Porik? Yeah, well, I, I think I'd actually build quite um, neatly on, and it, it wasn't prearranged, but on what Amanda just said, because ultimately, um, you know, we're all human, and uh, the instinct in all of us is to respond emotionally to a, to a crisis situation. And, you know, even if you look at it from an academic point of view, the reference point for how you have to address a crisis situation is you have to look at those who are most impacted and you have to accommodate the, dis the dislocation that they're, that they're experiencing. I mean, ultimately, the, the, the starting point for your resolution is accommodating the understanding impact that are most affected by it. So you have to start from that place. Um, but it's also, I think the key thing that I would, would, would put forward is it's about maintaining a perspective because the, would you, and I think it's important to distinguish between opportunity and opportunistic. Uh, but if you look at what Ben touched on earlier on, seeing the positive in things, uh, when you see the positive in, in, uh, in, in, in a crisis and you step back from it and take a perspective, it says, well, what can we do to accommodate the, the feelings and the perspective of those who have a loss and to bridge over the situation they're in now and to build a bridge from the situation where they find themselves now, which is at a loss of some description, whether it's real or imagined at that moment in time is irrelevant. They feel it, therefore it is. So the, the, the task we have as communicators is to bridge across that, to, to cope with them, to help them to cope with the circumstances in which they find themselves, but to also find a, a path towards some element of resolution. And therein lies what I would see as the opportunity. And the, you know, that may be a restoration of something that they've lost. And ultimately, it's some exchange of value on which they had relied on, whether that's a financial thing, whether that's an you know, emotional thing, whether that's a relationship, whether that's a, the, the utility of something, use of something, they've, they've lost something temporarily or perhaps for longer that they need some sort of, of a replacement for a resolution of. And in, in providing that, what we have is the opportunity to do the right thing by them, but also to demonstrate our values, to demonstrate um, you know, our, our, a sense of empathy for people um, and, and keep an eye to the longer term and some, some degree of recompense or, or restoration for them. So the opportunity lies in being able to help people walk that path and provide a perspective for them. Because what, what gets lost in, in a crisis situation because we are driven by emotion is that thing of perspective. So the crisis responder, uh, those of us who are in the position to assist, really have to look at the perspective around the future and restoring, which is where the opportunity presents itself. And, and I see it in those terms. So really, I mean, uh, what you're saying there is that there's always a bigger narrative. That, there uh, is at some, uh, there is, in many there is different a, ways. There is a future. For, for there, is a, there is a bigger narrative, yes. Um, and it is supporting people in, in, in their acceptance, their, their, their realisation. It's like the stages of grief. It's a version of that. It's supporting people to the stages of, of recognising, realising, coming to understand, uh, and, and, and then being able to, in some way, build their own confidence in and their knowledge in, in, in an alternate or a restoration or whatever that may be. So what, you know, the opportunity is really based in having a perspective around that rather than being, so it's appreciating and being empathetic to the emotional response, but being able to, to bridge across it into something that is, that is, uh, that, that, that is a future. Okay. Uh, can we put this uh, thinking into practice here? Uh, ben, can we move on? We're going to share with you some two of the examples of the uh, case study. So um, this was originally featured, many of them are originally featured in Michael's book, uh, When It Hits the Fan, uh, which is a classic Michael style of uh, a book title. Um, and they're fabulous case studies. Um, I approached Michael years ago. So, Michael, I'm doing some lecturing on crisis. If you've got any material you can share any examples, and he shared these, and I've used these around the world and they are brilliant they get a great reaction so it's really sort of gamifying communication strategy crisis strategy so we're going to share with you two of the examples and we're going to invite you for your responses of an a b or c so it's all anonymized um but uh, hopefully the, uh, uh, the the polling is working here so uh, ben let's uh, want to talk us through the uh, first of these scenarios Sure, sure. I'm going to read these directly off the screen because these are these are these two examples are 
actually straight from the book. Um, so they're sort of of their time, but they're very, very apt still today. Um, so I'll read them exactly verbatim and then I'll give you all a chance to hopefully uh, add your opinions on the polls. So uh, number one, first up, baby mattresses. <clears throat> so imagine you sell baby care products nationwide and a lone scientist claims to have discovered that a chemical in cot mattresses is the cause of mystery cot deaths. A national consumer television program tells you that they are going to broadcast a documentary profiling the scientists' claims and your mattresses. You are certain that the scientists' research is flawed and that your mattresses are safe, but it could take months to prove it. So that's the scenario. Do you, A, robustly argue in the documentary and elsewhere against the scientists' claims and run a customer reassurance program? B, say and do nothing as the scientist is a lone wolf and the program is only a one-off, so the fuss will all die down soon. Or C, withdraw all your cot mattresses from sale at a huge cost to yourselves, announcing that you are certain they're safe, but will leave absolutely nothing to chance. I'm gonna try and put the poll up here and I'll leave that um, the options up on the screen, so. You just cross. And... So A, B or C. What do you think would be the best response here uh, in terms of dealing with this lone scientist one-off TV show? Okay, guys, I haven't got access to the, the poll there, so do please put in your answers. Uh, if you can do it straight away, because we've got another one to get in before we uh, move on. So, uh, like any crisis, uh, you know, you've got to think on your feet, do it quickly. So, guys, A, B, or C, quick as possible. Um, and I always wanted to say this, and our survey said. Um, yeah. We'll give it a moment longer because they're flying in at this rate. Okay, mate, let's get the answers in. It's, it's sort of paused, so we'll give it just a few more seconds. We've got 34 out of 42 attendees already having responded. Oh, come on now. It's a great yeah. response, but we could always like to... 10 more seconds and we'll give it a stop. Okay, how's it doing, mate? Okay, well, I'm we have excited to be giddy here. So, uh, Ben, uh, I'm going to just write this just in case I can't see them on the next go. So, our survey said I can share results. Hopefully, they should be shown now in the chat. Oh, wow, that's very interesting. Okay, yeah. Right. Uh, so, number A coming out nudging me there, uh, num closely followed by B, and then uh, just a few for C. Uh, sorry, followed by C, and then just a few for B. Uh, and again, I think one of the key lessons here, Ben, is that actually any crisis comes, it's a judgment call as opposed to a definitive yes or no here. So, uh, Ben, uh, what was the response uh, uh, in, in, the, in, in the teaching pack there? To reveal the results. So, um, how did you score? Well, uh, according to Dad's um, very scientific scoring uh, system in his book, <laughs> those who said A to robustly argue and um, you know, uh, counter the claims and uh, give reassurance should get a healthy three points. Um, obviously, it's still a, a decisive um, reaction. Um, for those who say to do nothing and stay out of it all, um, unfortunately, you're only getting away with one point. Although I will say, I do remember dad saying to me, you know, uh, I didn't know much of the details of his client work at the time, but I do remember him telling me about times when he advised to say something and the, custom, the company kept quiet and then they got away with it. Now, I'm not saying that that's the, ever the right thing to do. It's, it's not for me to judge, but um, it was uh, that is a, that is an option available at any time. But for those of you who picked C, to withdraw the cot mattresses uh, at a huge cost, um, we'll get five points because that is what uh, Boots the chemist did, um, and it was considered to be a, a very sensible move at the time. Yeah, but okay. So um, next next slide there, and uh, nice checking of detail there from Elona to everyone. Yet, yeah, so no problem there. Okay, so uh, next scenario, please, Ben. So next up, I love uh, this one. Number two, the worst burgers. This one's a bit more. Uh, uh, relaxed, a bit more casual. So you run a nationwide fast food chain and a Sunday tabloid newspaper calls you late on a Friday night to say that your burgers have been identified as, quote, worst in the country in their own survey of fast food outlets. They will run the story on Sunday's front page and ask you if you would like to comment. So do you, A, call in your, your lawyers. In fact, I'll tell you what, I'll put the poll up as we're speaking, 
No, I'll read it out first to keep it consistent. So A, do you call in your lawyers and seek an injunction to stop the newspaper publishing? B, offer the newspaper a deal offering a free burger to anyone who visits one of your outlets on Sunday morning carrying a copy of their newspaper? Or C, provide the newspaper with a written statement defending your burgers and warn them that you will sue them out of existence if they unfairly harm the reputation of your product. So A, B or C there. They're getting the poll up there, Ben. So corner lawyers there it is. offer a free burger or warn them that sue them out of existence so a b or c guys and result and we, got, we got a very good response to the last one let's see if we can beat that this time 32 are they, already are they coming in they're coming in ben yeah thick and fast we've got 33 out of 42 people and obviously there's bound to be some people who probably can't respond yeah. so we'll give them a few more seconds but we're at 35 already it's almost everyone Five, four, three. Okay, Ben, uh, our survey said? Our survey says... Pretty decisive this time. All right. So clearly there be after the promotion. Uh, surely this can't be a true story, is it? <laughs> of course it is. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so Dad gave, a, gave one uh, commiseration point to those who seek an injunction. Uh, with A and um, and get, didn't give any points to those who decided to try and sue the uh, tabloid out of the out of existence. <laughs> but uh, for those of you old enough to remember the Happy Eater food chains, um, that's exactly what they did, and it was considered to be a very successful because um, <laughs> you know it was a great marketing campaign in the end. I love the comment of man about don't pick a fight with senior police officers who want to, uh, but don't pick a fight with people who buy their ink in vats. And uh, uh, I, I love this story here. As I say, great, wonderful example of Bland's law in operation there okay next slide there ben so you see the example of the teaching pack we've got 10 of these and we've also in our, in our work we actually come across another meme of bland's law once removed uh so remember that one amanda anyway so uh, uh ben do you want to move on the next slide here? so bland's law once removed is that someone else's crisis can be an opportunity for you and you think about it, um, you might write a thought leadership piece, uh, an opinion piece, or in certain brand rivalries such as Ryanair v British Airways, you know, make humour and so on. Um, so, and yet in, it's none, in none of the textbooks do you see this um, dimension or facet of, you know, capitalising on other people's uh, crisis. So, uh, Bland's Law once removed is that someone else's crisis can be an opportunity, but it comes with a massive health warning. Uh, as Amanda referenced earlier, we had some uh, uh, quite in-depth talk about this. And um, as I say, so before doing, before considering it, make sure it doesn't involve any loss of life, injury, or vulnerable people in any way. Uh, and the old adage, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. So by raising your profile, is there a danger that you could then uh, be equally guilty, um, uh, e accused of the same thing there? Or think ahead, could you be in the glass house tomorrow? And also be wary of chain reactions. So by doing something, yes, you make an impact, but then what could be the further response there? And really critically, only act in alignment with your purpose, values, and brand character. So the example there, for example, like Ryanair making humor, you could argue is aligned with its values. So again, so a really a key dimension in crisis PR that, as I say, doesn't really get covered in the textbooks, but is a reality. Um, and really, again, another meme there out there of Bland's Law once removed, but with the caveat of the health warning there. Uh, Amanda, I, mean, is, is that, I know we've had a discussion about this. Um, uh, is that a point you'd like to emphasize? I, I think there's, I think it's the, the, there's a scale, isn't there? From, yeah. you know, trying to make uh, light of somebody else's crisis through to the, the kind of acceptable end where actually, you know, so seeing somebody else having to deal with an issue, just thinking of, I don't know why Ovo and Eon came into my mind, because if, oh, if when Ovo's problems emerged, Eon, you know, had an opportunity, didn't they, to perhaps check through what they were doing and look and, you know, they had an opportunity to do something different, um, almost capitalise on it in a slightly different way. Um, but similarly, yeah, they could very well, and they were, if they'd have made light of um, of Ovo, end up in the very same thing within a few days. So um, it's just that air of caution, I suppose, around no. how you take that forward. Not saying you shouldn't, but it's yeah. about kind of how you take it forward. Yeah. Uh, Porik, any views on Bland's Law once removed? 
Yeah, look, I think it's dis disruption in the marketplace, disruption in a society, disruption always creates um, opportunities. And I think, again, you have to, um, you know, factor in those who would be participating in that um, and, and recognizing the need for respect, recognizing the need for, you know, um, that, that you do something in a way that, you know, that, what is that that phrase that some of the tech companies use, do no harm. So, you in, know, in in, you know, taking advantage of disruption is a natural market phenomenon, it's a natural societal phenomenon. But in doing so, you have to have, uh, you know, um, take account of what one might call, uh, you know, best practice principles of, 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 you know, looking after the people that might be impacted by that in a, in a, in a positive way. But disruption is, is a natural phenomenon. Therefore, where uh, disruption creates an opportunity, as long as that opportunity isn't profiting um, or taking ill advantage of the uh, misfortune of others, then, no. it, then it's, it's sensible. Thank you. So, uh, Ben, can we move on? Because uh, there's a lovely story we've got to share with before we go. Um, uh, Mark, Bukowski, um, and again, a lovely story of um, Bland's Law here, uh, and maybe a PR party game here of what's the most outrageous suggestion any client has ever considered, uh, and this is a true story. So picture the scene back in September 1997, uh, the run-up to uh, the funeral of Princess Diana. And a video game company approached Mark, uh, a you know, well-respected uh, PR consultant, and with their idea that was, quote, guaranteed to generate global coverage. And the idea to hijack the funeral of Princess Diana by staging a mass costumed zombie alien invasion during the ceremony. Uh, so we posed the question, how are they right and how are they wrong? Um, and uh, and I say, Ben, the next slide, please. Um, uh, and you'd be pleased to know that Mark successfully dissuaded the said company. Uh, it does amazing. Uh, well, actually, in our life, in the, in the work in PR and communications, nothing can surprise you. There's, so, uh, again, a wonderful there. So, but from Mark's viewpoint, it helped build, uh, it was an opportunity in building his relationship, you know, saving the client's bacon, uh, you know, providing that grounded uh, authoritative advice, which really is the, you know, the hallmark of any great crisis communications practitioner. Uh, so, really, before we leave, uh, really, a sort of a call to action. Uh, ben, the next slide, please, mate. So really what we're doing here is uh, changing um, uh, on, on board here is um, that we want this not to be a one-off. Uh, we've got a LinkedIn page, which is a sort of a hub where we're going to be adding to the case studies. We see this as a very organic resource uh, that maybe every year we could produce a new version with new case studies, new examples. Um, and so we invite you in the audience to you know, get in touch and uh, share any examples. We've already got a couple of good candidates in the pipeline already. Um, you know, do take on board the inspiration that in any crisis and any dark cloud, there's a silver lining and the lessons of Bland's Law and also Bland's Law or once re removed and really please anyone um, whether in education use it in teaching training or as a practitioner are you seeing you're going to have great fun and inspiration enjoyment uh, you know playing at uh, but some really good profound information uh, and thank you francis there and again to repeat a massive thanks to uh, the PRCA for their support in this. And again, a great example of um, a purpose led organization promoting professional practice. So there's a link, uh, it's on the LinkedIn site there. And please, you know, wherever you can, use the hashtag Bland's Law. So as a call to action there, I hope you've really sort of found this uh, insightful, um, um, wonderful stories, which I think Michael would have been proud of, but also great practicality. Uh, but obviously, we can't go really, I think really the final word uh, has got to belong to Ben and the family there. Uh, next slide, please, Ben. So, so final word, Ben. Uh, Thanks, Annie. I hadn't prepared a final word, so I thought I'd, let, I'd listen to what we discussed and then just see what seemed to kind of fit. And um, it's funny, the, the sort of world that I work in um, it, it generally involves kind of uh, AI, the ethics of AI, and then in particular, um, empathy on lots of different levels, especially around technology that's attempting to understand how human emotions work, which is raising a whole load of ethical questions of it in itself. And, um, you know, it's kind of feeding into this 
this new sort of world that we, we're all facing around um, you know, technology and whatnot. And it, the word empathy just comes up every time. And I'm sure that's true in the work that um, anyone, anyone of you working in crisis communications uh, you know, also faces that ultimately, um, if you're coming from a place of empathy, I guess um, we can be highly creative because we at least know we're um, standing on the right side, you know, in the right person's shoes. And I think Dad would have um, taken a similar approach. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you so much. And thank you everyone here uh, for this celebration of the wonderful Michael Bland. Thank you. <laughs>